don't think I'm contagious. I do not believe so. I'm not running a fever. I was previously, but not today. So uh, anyway, I'm not here because anybody made me, except I felt like the Lord wanted me to be here today. So uh, all right. So this morning, I'm going to take just a few minutes, and I really, this may be one of the shorter sermons you hear me, you hear me preach, but I'm going to get to the uh, cut to the chase, so to speak, and, and give you the message that is on my heart for this church at this season in our life. First uh, Corinthians chapter 2 is where we're going to start off this morning. Uh, I did my doctorate level studies in uh, church revitalization, and I spent a lot of time over the last three years studying, talking to pastors, studying uh, studying papers and reading books and uh, talking to those on the front lines about what are successful churches doing. Of course, we realize that the church is only built by the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so it's him. Uh, you can do everything right by the man's book and still not have church growth. It's got to have God's hand upon it. But there are certain things that we see in churches you know, all you hear about in America is how the church is on decline and pastors are quitting and churches are closing and, and, and you hear that bad news. But I want you to know that God's still growing his church and God is still building his church. You think, oh yeah, but that's just those mega churches. Did you know that the average church size in America is uh, under 100 on Sunday mornings? Uh, even with the few great big mega churches, the big huge churches, the average size is just under 100, but that doesn't mean that God is not moving and is not doing great things. God continues to build churches in Arkansas and around this country, and I believe God wants to continue to build First Assembly at Bearden uh, for the days in which we are facing. So one of the things, oh, Pastor, are you going to talk to us about academics? No, that's just a little lead-in. One of the things that I have found in almost every church that was able to experience revitalization. Well, what does that mean, first of all, by revitalization? It means they'd been in a period of declining finances and attendance, and then that reversed, and they started going up in attendance and in finances. In almost every single one of them, in fact, I'd be hard-pressed to find any examples where this wasn't the case, they got a higher percentage of their membership involved in the work of the church. Now, that sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Sounds simple, but why is it so hard to do? <laughs> There's a, a principle that you learn in business, and it's called the Pareto Principle, and it says that 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. We find that you think about it where you work or where you used to work if you're retired. And if we think about it, even in the church, it seems like 80% or more of the work is done by 20% of the people. But in churches that have begun to see uh, uh, growth again after declining, they all said that over 60% of their people, now not just members, I use the word members, but congregants who come there, over 60% were involved in some kind of work in the church. I think there's a wonderful key right there. That's why God gave me uh, this message, and there may be some more in future weeks, but for today, it's time to let God's spirit move in. Bearden, we've got to, we've got to make our move. The old saying is, strike while the iron is hot. Uh, you may have heard, you know, fish or cut bait, <laughs> but it's time to make our move, right? It's time to not stop talking about it and do something for the kingdom of God and in alignment with what we've been talking about, loving our neighbors and changing our world, how can we be a growing church? How can we get more members uh, involved? How can we affect our culture from the 50 or 60 of us that are, uh, that are that call this church their home church. Well, folks, let me tell you, I've already said it. 
We're going to get to the Bible verses in just a second. But unless God builds his church, those that build it labor in vain, right? It's got to be the Lord. So we need to start by being sure that we are true to our heritage. We need to be a church of the spirit. Before I just start signing people up to say, you go do this and you go do that and this is your ministry, I want to know that we have a church filled with the Holy Spirit, amen, that we have let the Spirit of God move in and that we don't just say, yes, we are assembly of God by name. You know, I went to pastor a church many years ago before Caleb was born and they told me, it says assembly of God on the door, but we're basically Baptist. (laughs) And I thought, well, I can change that. But anyway, that's another story. I want us to be true to our Pentecostal heritage, to our distinctive, that we are spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-directed people so that when God births an idea in us, it's not just our idea, but it is breathed into us by the power of the Holy Spirit because, folks, isn't it much better to say, God, what are you doing, and let me be involved in that as opposed to saying, God, I'm going to do this, and I hope you're involved in it, right? Exactly. Because then we got to wonder, we got to hope, we've got to, you know, not be sure if God is going to bless our work. If we do our own thing and then ask God to bless what we're doing. But if we of the Spirit discern what God wants us to do, you can know that he's in it in his power and his anointing from the very first step. Right? Are y'all, y'all track with me? You understand what I'm trying to say? So what blocks the Holy Spirit from moving in me? What blocks him from moving in our church? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 all the way down to 14. The natural person does not accept the things of God for they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things but is himself to be judged by no one for Who has understanding of the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. uh, But I, brothers, continuing into chapter 3, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk and not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. While there is jealousy and strife among you, Are you not of the flesh and behaving only as human in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? I actually read an extra verse there, but we'll just leave it right there. Father God, thank you for what you're saying to us today. Help me, God, anoint me this morning to overcome these physical uh, limitations, Lord And just help us to have ears of the Spirit to hear what you are saying to the church today. Let everything that I say be of you and for you to the building up of your people and to the glorifying of your name. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. What can block us from operating in the Spirit? The first thing Paul says is living as mere men. Where is that, Pastor? Verse 14. The natural person, a merely human person person now just plain people just plain people can do some pretty amazing things just people not spirit-led people but just people have built you know the uh, Eiffel Tower and the Hoover Dam and uh, interstate systems and they've put men on the moon and brought them back again and and they you know they, they've done some amazing things just mere men But folks, we're not talking about just building a building or erecting a physical structure. We're talking about a spiritual fight, a spiritual battle, a spiritual war over the souls of men. And Paul says if we are not spirit-filled, we cannot be spirit-led. We may do great things, but if we want to do spiritual things, if we want to win the spiritual war, if we want to grow the kingdom of God, we've got to be spirit filled so that we can be spirit led you follow me you track with me it's right what Paul says right there you see if we are fleshy if we're that word carnal which you'll see in your Bible sometimes and you'll hear us preachers say it just means being led by the flesh 
by the human, human side of you instead of being led by the Spirit. If we're led by the flesh, the Scripture says we sow unto the flesh. We sow our seeds in the flesh. But if we're led of the Spirit, we're sowing seeds into the Spirit. And seeds sown into the Spirit lead to life everlasting. Folks, I want to see great things happen in Bearden. I want to see us be able to be a part of beautifying our city, picking up litter, getting the, the, the parks that we have where people can enjoy them, helping there be a baseball league in town, doing whatever that are practical things. But above all, I want the Spirit of the living God to be involved with whatever we do so that as we go out and pick up trash or, or, or help beautify the park or whatever we may do in a practical term, we are not acting as mere men and women, but we're sowing seeds of the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want us to allow the Holy Spirit. Paul says there, are you not acting as mere men? In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, in other words, he looks at this church that has so much spiritual potential in it. You know, he has to instruct them later on how to have a, a proper worship service because of all the spiritual uh, gifts that are being in the church. And then he says, aren't you acting as mere men? You guys are blowing my mind. You started in the Spirit. You were saved by the Spirit. Why then are you acting like mere men. You are not. I want to tell you, church, if Jesus is in your heart, you are not a mere Christian, as C.S. Lewis uh, wrote about, a mere Christian. We are the vessels of the Holy Spirit of the living God. We are a house on earth for God. We are we are tabernacle. We are vessels of the Holy Spirit. We're no longer mere men, but the living God of this universe lives within, within us. And we need to surrender that flesh to the flow of God's Holy Spirit, to allow Him to lift us up above our limitations and to guide us and direct us in the things of the Spirit. So, uh, hey, Pastor, you know, what's the difference? What's the difference in the, the mere Christian and the spirit-filled Christian? What's the difference between people in this service just sitting and listening to the message and people who don't even go to church? Are we just walking around like mere men? Is what we do this week just like... Let me back up. If we just simply come to church and listen to the songs and listen to the sermon but then go back out there and just act <clears throat> just like those who didn't go to church. We are mere men. We acknowledge that there's a God, but we deny the power thereof. <clears throat> We've not been called to sit together and say, oh, I'm a, I, I'm a, a congregant of Pastor Travis. I, you know, Pastor Travis is my pastor. First Assembly is my church. That's all right. But what we're designed and created to do is to go out and be little Jesuses, little Christs. That's what the word Christian really means in our society. <clears throat> to take what we feel in these songs and what we hear in the preaching and what we study in our word and live it and give it, right? You following me? We got to live it so that we can give it. We are not just to simply come and acknowledge the church. Listen to these Crazy statistics from the church. 50% of members of mainline denominations, of which they lump the Assemblies of God into that, say they are not certain of their salvation. They go to church, they claim to be a Christian, they say they are a member of such and such church. Are you sure that you're saved? Well, I hope so. We don't have to hope so, amen. We can know so. The Bible says we can be sure of our salvation. Well, listen to this. Six out of ten seldom attend church, meaning less than once a month. But they say they're a Christian and they're a member of the church. Hmm. Seven out of ten give less than 1% of their income to the church or to missions. Less than 1%. I think we've got a credibility problem. We're saying one thing, but we're doing another. Eight out of ten have no ministry within the church. Nine out of ten say they have never sat under discipleship, uh, men, uh, uh, discipleship from their church or have been trained in how to properly share their faith. Whew. What's going on? 
We've got a disconnect. We've got a lot of folks saying, Lord, Lord, but they're not obeying the commandments thereof. We've got a lot of folks saying, oh, yes, yes, I believe America ought to be a Christian nation. But we're not being spirit-led and spirit-dependent uh, the way that God created the church to do. I want to tell you, folks, uh, that God said... One of my favorite verses in the Bible, I quote to myself quite often in John 10 and 10. He said, the thief only came to steal and to kill and destroy. But y'all know what the rest of that verse says? But I am come that you might have life and life more abundantly. God intends for us to not just be merely getting by. You know, I used to hear a song, oh, build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. Folks, that's just hoping you just slide by. I hope I just make it to heaven by the skin of my teeth, as the old saying is. God has prepared for his people a mansion in his house, right? That's what the scripture says. Nothing about a little cabin back in the corner for those that barely make it in. You're either going to walk into the applause of heaven or you're not going to make it. There's no sliding in. But folks, Jesus said, just simply saying, I'm a Christian. Yes, I believe in Jesus is not enough. He said, on that day, there will be those that say, Lord, Lord. And I say, depart from me, I don't know you. What made the difference? Those who truly live their life in surrender to the Lord God Almighty. And you can't live in surrender to the Lord as your Lord Almighty unless you are led by the Spirit of God. For our God is a spirit and those who approach Him must approach Him in what? Spirit and in truth. So church, it's not enough to just give mental assent. It's not enough to even say, I believe. The devil believes. We've got to surrender to the spirit of the living God. So the first thing that will block the flow of the spirit is if I just want to be just a mere Christian, just a mere human. I, I, I want to have fire insurance. I want to make it to heaven and not go to hell. I'm going to live my life, though, according to my own plans and dictates and what I want to do. You're blocking the flow of the Holy Spirit because God created you and he saved you for so much more than just to go to heaven at the end of your life. Secondly, what will block the Spirit? Not living in expectation of spiritual abundance. What? Not expecting God to bless you. Christians are those who have received Christ as our Savior. They got saved, but they are not being effective in the work of the kingdom. Now, where, where does Paul talk about this? He says, the natural person doesn't receive the things of God. They're folly, and he's not able to understand them. They're spiritually discerned. But the spiritual person judges all things. But then he says in chapter 3, verse 1, Brothers, I can't address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. This is what I'm talking about. He says to them, you are not living in the abundance of the Holy Spirit. He said, calls them brothers, so they're saved. They have accepted Christ. They've made a profession of Christ. But he says, I can't speak to you about the deep things because you are not walking in the abundance of the Holy Spirit. You're still walking the way that you were. You said you've given your heart and life to Jesus, but there's no power in your life. Uh, the weeds and the things of the flesh and the sin. See what I mean? I'm telling you, I, I said this yesterday, and I mean it. God has something big for us as a church because he keeps attacking. He keeps attacking us. <laughs> he keeps raising up. You know, I think we had a lightning strike or something Wednesday when those storms came through because a TV's out, a nursery TV's out, the camera's not working. You know what? My God is bigger than the devil. Uh, here I am today with what I feel like is an important word for the life of our church, and I feel like I'm, uh, uh, like I'm hindered uh, because I don't feel well, and I'm having a hard time getting in the flow uh, of, of preaching like I normally do. Uh, 
got an ear all stopped up in it. Anyway, that's just excuses. God is good all the time. But we're going to go ahead. We're going to give Satan a black eye anyway, right? So I don't want to just be a Christian. I want to be a John 10, 10 Christian. I want to be one of those Christians that lives in the abundance of the Holy Spirit. If God said, Jesus himself said, I came that you might have life, uh, that's the salvation part. But then he said, I want you to have life more abundantly. What's that part? That's the spirit-led part uh, of this Christian walk. That's that ability to speak to mountains and they have to, be, uh, they have to be removed. That's that ability to pray for the sick and see them recover. That's that ability to cast out death and to cast out demons and to do all kinds of work of the kingdom of God to pray for others and know that your prayer is not mere words but it is the power of God that is flowing through you the ability to have peace and joy even when you're going through struggles and battles and fights you know I'm talking about spiritual struggles and battles that ability to keep your peace and your joy even when things are going bad and things are going wrong that ability of God to keep moving forward those are the things that make an abundance life you know I've, I've been many times to hospital rooms where I was praying on my way there God give me something to say to encourage this person and when I got there they did the encouraging why because they were abundance Christians they might have been sick to the point of being in the hospital majorly, but they were still giving out the blessing of God. Why? Because there was a joy, 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 joy down in their heart. God had an abundance within them. So there's the, the non-Christian, which is where we're all born. Paul says there's no appreciation of spiritual things there. Like that Ethiopian who said... Uh, I, I can't understand the things that I'm reading in the book of Acts. Would you come and explain to me who this prophet is talking about? Is he talking about himself or somebody else? And Philip joined him in the chariot and explained to him. He was a natural man reading the Bible and he couldn't understand it until somebody with some spiritual insight came along and explained to him the things that he was. We all start off there as natural men. But then Paul says in verse 15 and 16 that there is a spiritual man. There is a man that is able, a human being, a man, a woman of God who is able to discern the things of the Spirit. That is what I want every one of us to have that spirit of discernment so that we all can sense and know what's going on in this world. When somebody comes up to us, uh, you know, we can sense and discern of the spirit what their need really is, what's really going on with them, whether they're just sick or whether they're demon uh, influenced right we can have discernment to to know whether i ought to turn left or go right whether i ought to stay home or go somewhere we can have discernment to, of knowing what god wants us to say and when he wants us to say it if we are the spiritual man we are a cause of, of amazement to this world think about it paul was a cause of amazement how he went from a terrorist to, to an apostle of god He's a cause of amazement. Isn't this the same one that was arresting us and killing us and, and taking us off to jail? And now he's preaching that name that he was against. He was a source of amazement. Stephen was a source of amazement. He preached Jesus to them. And even as they were stoning him to death, throwing rocks at him with the purpose of killing him, he looked up and said, even now I see Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And the last thing he did is similar to the last thing Jesus did. He prayed, forgive him. Forgive them. He's a source of amazement. Uh, let me recommend to you, if you've never read it, get a copy of this little book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. And you will find the stories of men and women down through history who have been executed in some horrific ways but have never recounted or backed up on their claim that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's a source of amazement. The things that are done of the spiritual man are a source of amazement. And you know what? They're supposed to be done in the eyes of those that do not believe. They're not only supposed to be done in this room where we all believe pretty much the same way, but they're supposed to be done as a sign for those that do not yet believe. Read the book of Acts. Those apostles were out there doing miracles in front of people who were not saved to give them a reason to believe on the name Jesus Christ. Man, how awesome would that be for us to take the Holy Spirit to 
one of the festivals or one of the events that they have down at the park, right? And just simply by being there, get the opportunity to work wonders in the name of Christ and, and cause things to happen at a you know, at a, a community event, a sporting event, a trash pickup, to be filled with the Spirit of God so that any moment when God opens the door, we can be messengers of what God wants us to do. Because, folks, let me tell you the third option. We're all natural men until we're born again. Then we are supposed to grow up into spiritual people. Growing up, Paul says, don't be spiritual babies. When you ought to be teachers having need of somebody to teach you. When you ought to be eating T-bone steak, you still got to have, uh, you know, a bottle. Don't be, don't be that way. Grow up. Don't just be a, a, you know, a newborn Christian that's been in church for 35 years and you're still a newborn. <laughs> Grow up in the faith and not just in gray hairs. <laughs> Grow up in Him. Uh. Maybe I should have let you preach today, Pastor Jared. I feel like I'm, I'm kind of spinning my wheels here this morning. But uh, God be glorified. There's the carnal man, and that's what we want to avoid. The carnal man professes Christ by his mouth, but is controlled by human nature rather than the Holy Spirit. The carnal man does things he ought not do and doesn't do the things that he ought to. Now, every one of us has that tendency. I read where the Apostle Paul said, I find myself doing the things I know I should not and not doing the things that I know that I should. The difference in the spiritual man is he knows that's wrong and he doesn't like that part of himself and he prays for the Holy Spirit to help him overcome that tendency. Whereas the natural man just sees no problem with it. Well, that's how the world is. You know, it's just how I am. You just got to understand me and God got a deal. He understands. What? I've had people in Assembly of God churches tell me that. Well, me and God just got an understanding. He knows I got a temper and, 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 and God's, or whatever the case may be. Folks, God wants you to be spiritually discerning to say there's a part of me that doesn't line up with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't look like Jesus. And I'm not happy about that. I don't want it to be there. I want God to transform me and to change me by the indwelling power of His Holy Spirit so that every day I look more like Christ and less like me. Every day I'm more dependent upon His Holy Spirit and less likely to blow up in the flesh. Every day I'm getting a little closer maybe only a millimeter maybe only an inch or maybe today a mile but every day I want to get a little closer and when I have a setback then I want to make it my effort to get past where I was before I had my setback I want to go further I want to get deeper listen to this I'm, I'm just about done Hebrews 5 says this when you ought to be teachers you have need that someone teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. Somebody once said that a baby was a digestive apparatus that made loud noises at one end and had no self-control at the other. <laughs> Sounds like some Christians that I have known. Make loud noises and have a little self-control. But Paul says, we got to grow up. we got to exercise. When I was a child, I did childish things, but now I've put away childish things we got to grow. We've got to learn. Man, even just since I've been preaching, I found this last time that we moved an old notebook, an old three-ring binder that had handwritten sermons from when I first started pastoring my first church. And I thought, how did they put up with me for three years if I was preaching that? <laughs> I don't know how y'all put up with me now, but certainly don't know how they did back then when I first started. I said, who? Nobody ever wants to preach that stuff again. And instead of saving it, it went in file 13 before we moved. I said, Lord, thank you that I've come 
I may not still be the best preacher, but I'm not who I used to be. Amen. And I look back at things I used to think about God and things I used to believe about the Bible that through practice and study and learning, I have found out that I didn't believe the whole truth or I was misled or had a misunderstanding. And we see growth in our life. He says that's how abundance Christians, people who are walking in the Spirit, don't have time nor desire to grumble and complain a whole lot because we're too busy taking the good news of Jesus Christ and applying it to the li- to our lives. We've got a joy, 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 joy down in our heart. And yes, we may see the problems, but we're not going to waste a lot of time uh, bad-mouthing and grumbling and complaining and chewing on the problems when we're going to just seek the Lord God who is the God of the answer. Answer, amen. Who is the God of the blessing? Who has a plan for every problem? Who has a way out of every miry pit? Who has the answer for every question? Right? Are you tracking with me? So, how to live that abundant life? Three simple things, and then we're going to pray. Number one, realize you have a need. First Corinthians thirteen. And 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but now that I've become a man, I've put away childish things. Church, I think if you will just be true to yourself, I know I can, and I believe everybody in this room can, think of areas where your spiritual walk needs some work. Maybe it's with your tongue, things you say that you wish you wouldn't say, or maybe it's with your You know, your attitude, or maybe it's with envy or jealousy or low self-esteem or whatever it is. Every one of us have those areas in our life where God's still working on us, right? The first step to living in that abundance, to having that flow of the Holy Spirit, is to say, God, I really need your help with my anger problem. God, I really need your help with this lying thing. God, I really need your help with whatever it is, whatever it looks like is to acknowledge that we have a need and say, I want to put that away. I don't want to be a gossiper. I don't want to be a backbiter. I don't want to be one who just complains about everything. God, I want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. You know, and, and we see the need and we, we ask God for his help in it. The second part is to repent. Oh, boy, that's not a word that gets talked about in church a whole lot anymore, is it? But Revelations 2 verse 5 says, Remember from where thou art fallen and repent and do your first works, else I will come to you quickly and remove your candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Repent. You see, when we realize that we've blown it, that we've messed up, that we've sinned, that we've whatever, fallen short of the, of the example set for us by Jesus, instead of saying, well, God understands. He knows my boss just pushes my buttons. Or, well, God understands how hard it is to be married to that person man of mine or that woman of mine God you know instead of making excuses which the world is full of if we want to be abundance Christians we say God forgive me for what I did what I said what I thought I don't care if everybody else is doing it it was wrong for me forgive me let me tell you it hasn't happened lately but there have been a couple of times I I, a lot of times I wear shirts that have a pocket on them And I'm one of those that will go into a store and think I don't need a cart. And after picking up several things, we'll realize I probably should have got a cart. And so it's real easy to slip something in your shirt pocket, right? It is for me. Well, a few times I have gone, especially since it's the self-checking almost everywhere now, check myself out, get out to the car, and realize that what is in my pocket did not get paid for. Now, I could say, huh, I got away with that. Thank you, Lord, for that blessing. But that's not a blessing of the Lord for me to steal whatever it was I just walked out with. But you turn around and go back into Walmart and you, uh, you know, and you say, I didn't pay for this. I got to pay for it. You're going to get some funny looks. (laughs) But it's still the right thing to do. You know, if you went to uh, the restaurant and and you paid for your meal, say your bill was, was $21 and you gave her 30 and she gave you back change for 25 wouldn't you say something about it oh wait a minute well then why wouldn't we if we were to get too much money back wait wait you know yeah what are you saying 
I know there are areas in my life that need work, and I want to be submissive to the Holy Spirit. I want Him, uh, you know, even when I stand out like a sore thumb, even if I'm doing something that other people wouldn't do, I know a guy, I could call him by name and give you his address, who says stuff like that happens where you walk out with batteries or whatever and you didn't get caught. The Lord just blessed me. God's had God just got a way of blessing me. I don't believe that at all. I think that's a shame. I think it's theft. I think it's, you know, anyway, we ought to know better. Thank you, sis. I appreciate that I know at least, at least Sister Carolyn's with me this morning. That's all right. Praise God. I'm telling you, we've got to repent. It's, you know, even if the whole world is doing it, if God tells you it's wrong, then you better repent of it and say, God, help me not to do that anymore. Are y'all with me? Everybody understand? I'm not trying to call y'all all liars or thieves or whatever. What I'm saying is every one of us have areas in our life where we still need God to work on. And every one of us will from time to time mess up. And we got to go back and say, God, I don't like that. I don't want to be that. Forgive me and help me. And lastly, receive God's power. What did I say? Realize you got a need. Repent when you mess up and ask for God's power. Acts 1 and 8 says you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He didn't say you might, you could, there's a chance. He said you will. You with me? He didn't say there's a possibility. He didn't say that you've got a, a greater than average odds of winning. You know, it always cracks me up to see these commercials for uh, uh, casinos and whatever where they say, our slot machines pay out the most. <laughs> like, yeah, maybe so, but you still lose more than you win. That's how these places make money. You know, it's like saying, anyway, anyway, let me get back on track. God doesn't say you got a chance. I'll give you a pull of the lever and maybe it'll come up, you know, jackpot. He says, you will, you will. That's a promise. Everyone who asks will receive power from God that comes down from on high so that we can be his witnesses. I want to tell you, that excites me. It means that God knows all about my past. He knows what I'm doing right now, and he knows my tomorrow, but he still says, I'm going to give Travis power to be my disciple in this world. He still says, I'm going to give you power to be an abundant Christian. Why? Because God wants you to have peace and joy and hope and love and the blessings of God that flow without end and he wants you to make a difference in this world so we got to get out of our own way we got to get out of our own way and walk in the spirit so that we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh it's really simple as that that sounds hard but I've just boiled it down to you I did a lot of talking to say really Realize where your area of need is. Repent and ask for help. And then expect to receive spiritual power. Because God said, if you'll ask it, I will give you power. Mm. Praise God. It's as sure as if I take my drill over there and plug it in that outlet. If that outlet is connected the way it's supposed to be, my drill is going to work. Right? So when I ask, God... I need your power to overcome this area in my life. You're going to get it. God, I need your power to witness to my friend, neighbor, family member. It's like plugging into the outlet, man. God says, you ask and I will deliver. God, I need your ability to overcome this besetting sin in my life. Expect to receive that power. God, I need your forgiveness. Expect that it's already done when you ask for it in Jesus' name. So here's how we're going to close out today. I'm just going to simply ask for everybody in the room to stand with me, if you would. Would you stand? I don't know. Okay, I did better than I thought. I'm <laughs> kept y'all.